Well, we have the great pleasure of having Sister Pat Smith and Christy Wessling uh, here today as our presenters. And um, we look forward to uh, having them share their experience and, and their knowledge and their wisdom on evaluation, best practices, as well as uh, recruiting and hiring for mission. So I'm going to start with the prayer and then I will introduce uh, both speakers and then turn things over to Sister Pat who will, will start us off. So for prayer today, we have uh, something from Come to the Table and it's called This Ministry We Shepherd. So as we are always in God's presence, let us pray. Good and gracious God, creator of all that is, we gather to praise and thank you for your care of us and of our ministries that we shepherd in the name of the Sisters of Mercy. In the footsteps of Catherine McCauley, we strive to educate the next generation in Catholic values, merciful compassion, and right relationships with all people. May what we do together sustain the school and ensure its mission into the future. We pray that what we accomplish together as leaders will enable all the members of our communities of faith to grow to their full potential and become persons God intends them to be. May the spirit of God continue to shower us with wisdom and grace today and always. Amen. Amen. Sister Pat Smith has spent the last 10 years serving as a leadership team member for the Mid-Atlantic community. Prior to her time in leadership, Sister Pat served 20 years as the head of school for Waldron Mercy Academy. Her years at Waldron provided an opportunity to work with a board of trustees and understand better the importance of board formation. While serving on community leadership, Sister Pat was a member of the Institute Ministry Group and along with three other leaders developed the Mercy Education's Education System of the Americas. She has served as a Mercy Education Board member for the last four years. And Christy Wessling, a Mercy High School alumna. <laughs> It, uh, could I ask that everyone make sure that they are muted? <laughs> Got some feedback here. Okay. A Mercy High School alumna from the class of 1988, Christy Wessling joined the faculty of Mercy in 1995 as a math and business teacher. She holds degrees from the University of Nebraska at Omaha and Creighton University. She spent 19 years as a full-time classroom teacher and loved moderating Mercy's Student Council, helping young women grow in their leadership skills and in their journey to become women of Mercy. In 2014, she was named Mercy, Mercy Omaha's Assistant Principal of Academics and assume the role of principal in 2018. Christy is the proud mother of two Mercy alumnae and a current Mercy senior, as well as the ecstatic grandmother of Charlotte, future member of the Mercy class of 2037. So again, we thank Sister Pat and Christy for being with us today. And I'm going to turn things over to Sister Pat Smith. Hey, <clears throat> thanks, Kim. Kim, um, I appreciated that very succinct uh, introduction because it took a lot of years uh, and put it into a nice, simple explanation of what I've been doing over the last uh, 30 years. We won't even go before that. But um, when Kim asked me about doing this presentation, my first reaction was, Oh, wow, it's been a really long time since I've been involved in 
uh, because some of the topics were about evaluating faculty and staff or hiring faculty and staff. And I, for a moment, didn't feel really, um, you know, up to date, so to speak, on some of these topics. But then as I started to look at the areas which, which I said I would uh, respond to was about working with the board, evaluating permission, Sorry, Sister somebody... Pat, you just you just muted yourself. Okay, am I here? Yes. Okay, I, I didn't hit anything, but it must have just gone off. Um, so when we talked about the areas that I would uh, speak on, the board evaluation and the head of school evaluation, I certainly felt that in more recent years, I was involved in those areas. And so um, I was happy to help out in any way that I could. Um, looking at the group on here, I'm not sure how many heads of schools we have or how many board members we have, uh, but as I reflected on it, it, I don't know that that's really significant because as a head of school, the relationship with the board is so significant. And as a board member, the relationship with the head of school is certainly important. So uh, both of those roles really need to relate and to interact and to be sure that um, the mission is put first and foremost as uh, you begin to work together. Um, working with the Board of Trustees, when I look back on my own experience, I started out at uh, Waldron, as Kim said, we did not have an official Board of Trustees. We had an advisory board. And, you know, it was a great group of people, very dedicated to the school, et cetera. But as we moved into developing a Board of Trustees, the relationship was very different. And the importance of responsibility was much more key. The responsibility of the board members for the uh, success of the school and the, um, the assurity that the mission was alive and well was really key. Not that the advisory board didn't work towards that, but it really was a shift. And so for people who might be coming on new, either as a school leader in that type of a school working with the board or a new board chair, um, the key uh, to that relationship is just so important and really communication and support of one another is really so significant. And so when it comes time to evaluating the board's success and the school's success, um, you know, how is that relationship? Are we working together? Do we, are we on the same page as far as what we think the mission is about? And um, so that's, as we go forward and look at some of the forms that Mesa has developed, uh, those things are really very key. Um, also, it's really important as these boards were developed, I remember that the faithfulness to doing an evaluation was a, a little bit questionable, I'll be very honest. Um, it was not our most favorite thing to do. And so we talk about doing evaluation and then sometimes time would go by and it would be the same for the head of school. Uh, but I think as all of us have moved forward in the structure of our sponsored schools, our Mercy schools and have worked with Mesa, we really are very committed to assuring that the mission is alive and well, um, and that we're faithful, that we're really faithful to those evaluations. Um, and that's really a very important responsibility of the board chair to see that both the evaluation of the head of school and the evaluation of the board takes place annually and that all the board is involved in it and um, in both of those evaluations because they're very key. Um, and it's important to share the feedback when those evaluations are summarized and gathered to make sure that the whole board 
has a sense of what the uh, values are and how the board uh, views each of those uh, topics and both of those evaluations. Um, Mesa has developed forms over the last few years at, and Kim has and Susan will have access to them. So if you don't have your own form, um, it's really helpful to get a copy of those and see what fits your situation. Um, and I'll talk about some of the topics on those forms uh, just to be sure that uh, we know what's important for developing if we develop our own uh, evaluations. Um, I'm going to just ask, stop for a minute and ask a, a question. I know some people are pretty new, but uh, do people feel that they've had uh, experience with the boards? And is that experience a good experience or has it been a struggle in developing the relationship? Does anybody want to just, I mean, feel free to just speak out if you can, or I, I can't see all of the. Hi, uh, sister. This, this is Jared Buckley from uh, Mercy High School in Farmington Hills, Michigan. Right. And and we're just so fortunate to have uh, Dr. Cheryl Krieger as our president. And in, in terms of my relationship as the uh, as the board chair, it's been seamless. She is so helpful, and uh, it's just a fantastic relationship. And I I feel very fortunate to be in the position I'm in. Great. Thanks, Jared, for sharing that. Um, Susan, you know what, you could probably put down the uh, slide because I probably would feel like I uh, could have a little bit more exchange if I can see people. Um, thanks, Jared. I appreciate that because, again, that to me, having kind of, I'm going to say, grown up with developing the board, um, that was something that was at times a challenge. And again, depending on the leader of the board, the chair of the board, and the head of the school, how they relate is so important. And I have had the pleasure of uh, interacting with Cheryl uh, through the uh, mission stewardship reports over the last couple of years. And I, I definitely uh, would agree with you. She seems like a, a wonderful school leader. So it's good that you're feeling that support for one another. Is there anybody else who wants to talk about either their experience uh, on the board or as a head of school and how that board relationship is working or, or struggling? Yes, Jan Marie. Share. Sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just calling you. I noticed that you. Okay. Um, so I'll share. So for those who I don't know, because there are definitely some new people here, um, I am the um, principal slash head of school at Walter and Mercy Academy, and this is the start of my fifth year here. So I have been very fortunate that the heads of the board, starting with actually Kim, um, have been excellent. And I've had an excellent relationship with the board chair. I think where it's difficult is in creating the same relationship with the individual members of the board. Um, because I think certain committees um, lead themselves to kind of developing more of a, a mutual comfort level and respect and other committees like we have one committee that's just so big that the same thing just does not happen so like I think one thing you know, like we and as um, you know my recent board chair Joan is on here we've had this conversation about like should there be somewhat of like a mandatory requirement for new board members or new heads of school to like make that connection? And then the other side of the argument has been this piece of, you know, these are volunteers and how do you make something mandatory? But that's where I see, I think we have a little bit of a, a need to grow. Thanks, Anne Marie. And that would be a good thing as you develop an annual evaluation, uh, maybe to think about that question right there. While you're probably relating very positively or strongly with the chair of the board, are there other relationships or other uh, 
when you look at the committee structure question, which would be on an evaluation, is the communication with individual committees as strong as it might be with the chair or the executive committee? So thanks for uh, putting that perspective forward. Anybody else? Yeah, this is Carol Pfeffer from Assumption High School in Louisville, and I'm the, the board chair. Um, I think a lot of it gets down to setting expectations for board chairs, too. Um, we began our year calling ourselves, this is not just something to put on your Vita <laughs> or your resume. This isn't just a show up four times a year. This isn't just a perfunctory thing. This is a very important role. There are legal issues involved. There are ethical issues involved. Uh, there are MESA responsibilities involved. And I think a, a chair has to be, so it's good to have these kinds of training. A chair has to be taught beyond how to run a meeting, how to set an agenda, how to keep on top of all the things that are important with the budgets and all the rest and enrollment keep, there's more than that. And it is working with your committee chairs. It's knowing what they're doing. It's um, I'm, I'm education committee, but I need to know what's going on on the finance committee and I'm on the governance committee. So keeping those lines of communication straight and before every meeting, meeting with them ahead of time and saying, look, what are we reporting out on? Why are we meeting? <laughs> How are we gonna use this time well? And how's it re relate to the mission uh, to Mesa and, and keep putting that on our agenda and putting it in our minutes to remind ourselves of our own accountability. It's a fine dance. We don't wanna micromanage. That's not our job. But we have to be pretty engaged if we're going to do it well and keep in contact with, with the administration of the school. So it's a it's an honor to serve and keep learning. Thanks, Carol. Carol, are you a new board chair or are you one? I know there's some mentors on. I am a new board chair, but I was vice chair for three years. Oh, okay. Um, and I had taught there years ago before I, I went. So, so I have a little bit of, of a head start. Uh, because of those experiences. Good. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that perspective. Anybody else? Okay. Joe? Joe yeah. Haas? Uh, hello, everyone. Hi, Joe. Um, this is Joe Haas. I'm the new president head of school at Mercyhurst Prep in Erie, Pennsylvania. So I, first of all, just wanted to introduce myself and say hello. And I actually come from the nonprofit world. And so I've had the experience of working with a pretty weak board and then a board that was getting stronger. And walking in here, I must say, I'm very happy to see that there's pretty competent board and advisory boards here. So I'm, I'm excited to get started. This is my 11th day. So I can't say I have a vast wealth of experience in working with the board, but so far they've been very supportive and I'm looking forward to working with them and moving forward. So thanks. Thanks, Joe. I do think um, having been on Mesa for the last five years, I think that that is a wonderful uh, structure and support, particularly, I know that we've put a lot of uh, focus and energy into developing the boards. Not that we were, you know, not uh, concerned in, in certain situations, maybe about the head of school, but sometimes they do get more of a focus and there's more of a relationship with other heads of schools. So I think uh, my experience has been that there's been a lot of energy and education and focus and really wanting the board chairs to participate in the variety of presentations over the year, the forum, the workshops, et cetera, this, um, you know, the different groups that gather. So I, I think that has and will certainly have going forward um, help in strengthening all of the school boards, regardless of what they may or may not have been in the past. Um, okay, so uh, nice to meet you and good luck to you, Joe. Um, just a, a one or two other things related to the board that I'll say is, as I mentioned that we do have a form, um, a tool that can be used if you don't have an evaluation tool and uh, you can, uh, get that. Um, I went through and looked at the uh, list of things, and there's a good number of them. And I think, again, what are the things that your school really needs to focus on? They would be the things to evaluate first. And then, you know, going forward, you may want to add to them. But I think certainly the um, 
looking at is the mission alive and well? Do we ask that question? And somebody made a reference to this, and I know the Mesa board has started to do this, that at the end of the meeting, it's always a question, how has our discussion um, affected the mission? Are we committed to the mission when we're engaged in uh, dialogue with one another and making decisions. Uh, so I think having that type of always in front of us um, is really important. Um, and then uh, there's one of the things that sometimes we forget about is, are there non-board members that can enrich our committees? So when you're evaluating your board, <coughs> excuse me, is there anybody other than the board members who are supporting and are engaged? And are we missing uh, skills and experiences that might enrich our board, particularly if we have difficulty uh, getting board members and depending on where you're located, et cetera, that could be the case. Somebody made a reference to this in one of their conversations that um, the day-to-day -day events, we do not as board members want to be uh, engaged in the everyday work. That is the work of the heads of school. Uh, but certainly if there's a need to support that head in any issue or topic that's coming up, um, you want to be a part of that. Um, and then I talked a little bit about the mutual trust. That's so important to really make both uh, sides of the coin, so to speak, work. Um, and then certainly as part of our mission, identifying the Catholic identity of the school and educating, educating the board members, because sometimes that's the harder group to educate. Because as somebody mentioned, your volunteers, you're there on a limited basis, et cetera. Our staff, our heads of schools are there every day. And so we have the opportunity to really provide good education for them. But how can we do it with our boards? I think that's a question um, for the board chair and the executive committee to try to make sure that there is that type of formation and um, Catholic identity and mercy charism being put forward, particularly when you have new board members who may not have a history or a relationship uh, with the school or with mercy. Um, so anyway, if you don't have a uh, an evaluation form, or you haven't done it, maybe, or maybe you feel it's time for a new one, you know, touch base with Kim or Susan or someone from the office, and they'll be happy to share the uh, information that they have. Okay, is there anything else related to um, board evaluation and board relationship with the school that you might want to ask and you didn't get a chance? Okay. Well, I appreciate the input uh, that some of you did bring forward. I know that helps everybody really, um, even though everybody's experience might be different. And then the other side of the coin, so to speak, the head of school evaluation. Um, I'll be really honest about this, but you can't go outside of the Zoom and repeat this. But I think one of the things that has happened over the years in our schools because uh, many of, or most of the heads of school in the past were sisters, that sometimes board chairs were hesitant to do evaluations on the heads of school, particularly if they had been there a long time, like myself, I'll be very honest. Um, but I think all of us, as we look at our schools and as a Mesa board member, I have the privilege of looking across the board at our schools, we have many changes in the heads of schools going forward. And not that I support what was, I think there should have probably have always been some type of evaluation, but certainly as we bring new people on and new structures on our boards, et cetera, uh, the evaluation piece is more and more important. So I think that's why it is a topic that um, Mesa staff likes to bring forward to any of the new members either on the boards or as heads of school going forward. Not in a critical way, but really to look at what are the strengths of your board and your board chair? What are the strengths of your heads of school? And what areas can uh, 
you have the support that you need. And that's one of the roles and responsibilities of Mesa. How can we support you? How can the staff certainly support you? How can you support one another? I think that's one of the greatest um, blessings of Mesa that you've really come to know each other and you can support one another. Um, so those evaluations again are really important and they are the responsibility of the board and primarily the board chair to see that that's done each year. Uh, again, there is a form that Mesa has developed for the head of school and focused on mission and the main responsibilities of the head of school. Um, and then sometimes one of the things that as a, a member of Mesa, which I've learned is we certainly have a lot of different titles for our heads of school. Uh, so, you know, it can be president, it can be head of school, director, directress, et cetera. But it's really about what are the responsibilities of the person who has the most responsibility for the success of the school or the mission of the school, et cetera. And so um, they can be certainly um, forms that can be used either for president or for um, the head of the school. And what are the responsibility of those, those persons? And what is the responsibility of the board chair to be sure that um, those uh, responsibilities are happening and are and that the, the uh, head of school is being supported? I think that's so important. I said many times over the last two years that as much as I love being uh, a principal head of school, I really was very grateful. I was not in that position during these last two years um, with the pandemic. And I just have such great respect for all the heads of schools um, who have struggled through these times and have really been so successful in our Mercy Schools. So, uh, you know, you are to be applauded and hopefully your boards have really supported you um, through that time and helped you uh, in whatever the challenges have been for your particular school. Um, I think that might, is there anything related to the head of school or, or are there any new heads of schools on here? I know some people uh, are from somewhat familiar faces, but um, that have some questions or some particular struggles that in relationship either to the board or to their own evaluation you would wanna bring forward. I know Christy's gonna bring some more, uh, I'm gonna call it hands-on type of evaluation with staff and hiring, et cetera, um, that might be kinds of things that you're dealing with day to day. Okay, anybody else? Okay, and I'm sure at the end of Christie's, if there's some time left, we can open it up to any other questions that might come forward. Okay, so I'll turn it over to Christy. Um, actually, Christy, before you start, I'd like to, I'd like to invite um, some of the heads of school and some of the board chairs to share uh, some of the some of the things that Sister Pat um, had mentioned. You know, how what are some of the things that you're doing in your school that is helping to um, educate new board members as they come on in the in the mission and the Catholic identity of the school? So, if anyone is willing to to share, I think we learn best from from one another. Hi, I'm Ann Kanapke from Gwinnett Mercy Academy Elementary. And one thing that um, our board does at the end of each meeting is we reflect on our core values and the mission of our school and um, just have a brief sharing ses session. And I, I find that that really helps uh, the, our new board members as well as our um, longtime board members really connect with our mission and our school identity. Great, thanks Ann. Jane? Hi, I'm Jane Harrington from Mount Mercy in Buffalo. I'm the uh, new board president. Um, one of the things that we do, we have a, an older sister who was, I believe, a past 
president, but she actually does a little education session with all the new board members that sort of, and she shows us the video about Catherine McCauley, just so, because we've had a couple new board members who may not have been alum or may not know that information. So that really helps to give us all a little bit of background. Um, and it shows, you know, the origins in Dublin and everything like that, which I think helps for everybody to kind of know where we've all been coming from. Hi, uh, this is Jared Buckley. Um, we give each of our board members a, a three ring binder that uh, gives a good history of, of Catherine McCauley and the, the history of the school and the mission, the strategic plan, and uh, as much as we can put in there. And I think it's very, very helpful to the board members. Uh, yeah, and at, at Assumption, we begin every meeting with a mission moment, a teaching uh, from somebody at the school, often Marianne Suderman, because I, I, even I uh, have a mercy tradition, I remind our principal, these people come in four times a year. They're not living here. They're good people, and they're not ignorant people. But if you don't keep it in front of them all the time and relate it, we had really great discussions last year when everything was going on with racial issues. And it wasn't just about preparing the board. If we should get a question cold, what do we do? Uh, anybody who calls us, but how does it relate to the Mercy values? Um, and, and, and how does that inform our own thinking personally, not just as board members? So one of the things I'm grateful for is if we do that, it helps me grow as a Catholic in the Mercy tradition, not just as a board member. I really do think that's a benefit we share as board members. And, and we talk about that on our board. Uh, so, hi, I'm Joan Barone, and I'm the new board chair for Waldron Mercy Academy. Um, so our mission and board affairs committee takes uh, very seriously um, uh, ways to promote board growth and professional development. And um, one of their goals is um, at each board meeting, they take some time to, um, to do um, to do have have some way to inform the board or educate the board um, on something to do with um, Mesa or um, the Mercy um, the Mercy Sisters in general. So, for instance, um, at the last meeting, um, they um, talked about the critical concerns and the uh, the core values of the of the Sisters of Mercy, and. Um, the meeting that we have this week, they're actually going to be um, talking about the, the MESA, I believe it's the, called the accountability study. They're gonna be going reviewing that with, with the board members. And um, we also make sure that all the trustees are getting the MESA um, emails. I think you call them flash and there's, there's other types of, of uh, communications that are really good. Um, so, those are some of the ways that we try to always, um, you know, get as much information in front of the trustees as we can on a regular basis. Thanks, Jane. Jane, did you have another uh, comment? Or your, I guess the, your hand was still up, so I wasn't sure. And anyone else? So one of the things that we do um, as a, a staff uh, for Mercy Education is, you know, we, we have started a couple of years ago with having an intentional board formation process um, for new board members. Uh, and, you know, that has been a way to, uh, you know, for us to really help to orient um, the new board members to the relationship between the school and to Mercy Education, and also to provide some, you know, other suggestions and tips um, on best, best board practice. Um, and, and one of them is um, to have a, a mission committee. So I, I would just like to, um, you know, highlight that as something if you do not have um, a, a mission committee that, uh, you know, can bring these things and all these wonderful suggestions that have been um, put forward. That is something to, to consider. And, and also to consider that, you know, it isn't just the responsibility of the sisters 
um, on, on your board or to bring in your campus minister from the school to do these mission pieces that mission is really the responsibility of everyone. So, you know, by having a committee and by having other members of the board do a mission piece is also um, good for their formation as well. So uh, that would be something that we would want to uh, emphasize. So, all right, so with that, and we will have some time for more questions and comments after Christy's presentation, I'd like to turn things over to Christy, um, who, who will be uh, focusing a little bit more on, um, on some operational um, methods within the school uh, for evaluation practices and um, retaining and recruiting and retaining um, you know, members of the school community. But we thought that it really was important for everyone to hear that because you know, even uh, members of the board and the board chair need to be mindful that these, these practices are happening within the school. Um, it's, it's not you know, in your oversight capacity. So uh, we didn't wanna split, split the group and we felt that it would be a learning for, for everybody who, who was present. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Christy. Thanks, Kim. I'm going to try to share my screen here. All right. There we go. Well, uh, thanks so much. Um, I wanted to begin today just by sharing with you our mission statement. Um, this is uh, hanging in every classroom in our building. Um, I print this on every faculty meeting agenda or and sister does on the board meeting agendas. Um, it's highlighted in our printed materials and on our website. One thing that Sister Dolores Hannon, who is our president, has done at board meetings is, you know, just hand this out to people and ask them to all the board members to just sit with it for a couple minutes and and think about what what jumps out at you um, within the board meeting today of, you know, what what really resonated with you today, and then we all go around and share which piece of our mission statement is. Um, resonates with everyone and it's different and we've done this multiple times and it's just it's interesting that every time we do it you know it might be something a different word or a different phrase in our mission statement that uh jumps out at you or or means something just based on something that's happening in the school or in the world at that particular time so she also um at the end of every board meeting asks um how has our discussion forwarded the mission of mercy high school and so uh, that is very also just kind of wraps around there um, and helps us to just make sure that, you know, the whole reason we're here is, is for this mission for our students to, um, to make this, to give them the best that we can. Um, for those of you who aren't um, familiar with Mercy Omaha, we are, um, we were founded in 1955, but the Sisters of Mercy have actually been in Omaha since 1864. Um, and they landed in October um, on the banks of the Miss, uh, Missouri River in mud and had uh, two schools operating by uh, the end of November. So there's been an all girls school of some variety in Omaha, Nebraska since um, the latter part of 1864. So we're very proud of that. Um, and uh, we have a history wall in school that displays some of these various buildings throughout um, Omaha. Two of the, the last two schools uh, merged in 1955 and Mercy High School was kind of created from that. So we represent girls from 60 different elementary and junior high schools um, in the Omaha metro area. There's also seven other Catholic schools in Omaha. Uh, three of them are archdiocese and co-ed schools. And then the other five of us are single gendered order schools. So there's three all girls schools and two um, all male schools here what each of them has kind of a little different feel to them. And that's what I love about it. Um, it within, Merce, within Omaha, there's, there's areas for, uh, girls can find the school that fits best for them. And we hope it's our school, but we know that there's um, other girl, girls might enjoy going to Duchenne Academy or Marion High School as well. Um, we, operated on, we operate on a negotiated tuition system. 82% of our students receive uh, financial aid from the school. And the negotiation part of that happens um, in the right before their freshman years, the first time that they do it. Every family comes in and sits down with Sister Dolores 
and they uh, negotiate what their tuition is going to be. And so everybody pays something, but obviously um, this gives us a more diverse student body than some of our um, neighbors in the Omaha area. We have about 30% of our students are students of color and we have diversity across pretty much any, um, any measure that you can imagine. We have, um, whether it's academically, social, um, uh, within their um, uh, socioeconomic status all across the board, we're very, very diverse and we love, love that part of it. So this mission of being a diverse community and focusing on academic excellence and creating confident young women of mercy, that's, that's important to us and that has to be kind of at the forefront of everything that we do. Kim asked me to talk about our teacher evaluation progress, but process, but um, not so much the the day to day educational part, but specifically focusing on mission. And so for us, um, when I became principal, the uh, superintendent of the Catholic schools in Omaha had come to us from Raleigh and he had shared with the, all of us principals that they had this um, evaluation process they, they used that was based on the work of Charlotte Danielson and T Daniel McGrail. And um, many of your assistant heads of schools are probably familiar with this, some of you may be as well, but Daniel, Danielson and McGrail's work has four domains. And the, those are the first four that I've got listed on the slide. So planning and preparation, classroom environment, effective, effective instruction, and professional responsibilities. Um, we, borrowing again from the Diocese of Raleigh, added on, they had a Catholic piece, and then we just kind of tweaked it to add a Sisters of Mercy identity as a fifth domain for our teacher evaluation process. So this is everything, um, you know, summative evaluations that I do, formal observations in classrooms. Um, it's a self-evaluation process that the teachers uh, go through every year as well. So they evaluate themselves and then we talk about and I evaluate them on all five domains. But what I'm gonna focus on today is specifically that fifth domain. Specifically, the focus here is that our teacher, we want our teachers to develop an understanding and support of the Sisters of Mercy identity as well as our Catholic identity. Um, the skills that they're demonstrating is basically how do they support these missions and charisms um, through their words and actions, as well as their participation in our faith community at school. Um, these, it's important for, I feel like we have a great community here in Omaha and uh, sp specifically here at Mercy, but what we want them to feel is that this is a community, not just of sisterhood, but of faith in particular. So I'll show you next where those five, what the five criteria are for this. First of all, we ask that all of our teachers demonstrate knowledge of and respect for Catholic doctrine and beliefs. We have um, probably about 20% um, of our faculty is not Catholic, but we ask that they, you know, are, are very, part of when we hire them is that they need to be prepared to, um, defend or not defend, but teach our girls their Catholic faith and model that faith for our students and how to be respectful of that faith, even if you're not Catholic. Um, and the best thing about that is um, we, I can see teachers all the time. Our theology teachers become a huge resource for the other teachers. So if something comes up in class and you don't know, um, you can ask one of our theology teachers. They'd be very happy to help you. Um, our biology teacher's classroom is right across from the theology classroom. So anytime that she would get to the end on sexuality or something like that, and something would come up, she would like switch classes and pull Mrs. Van Cat in to talk to the biology girls too, just as a uh, resource and that support to make sure that we're telling what we're saying is, is fully in line with the teachings of the Catholic church. Um, we also ask that our teachers share in the charism of Catherine McCauley and the Sisters of Mercy. We ask that they make Catholic and Mercy symbols um, and teachings a part of their classroom life. That they help assist our students in Catholic spiritual development and that they within their classroom help, help form a faith community there as well as um, around the building. The next slide is a little bit harder to see. I was trying, I've tried to transfer a rubric that is on 
um, an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper onto some slides. It's not, it's not ideal, but I'll try to walk you through it and so you can see kind of what we're looking at for those. So um, within each component, the teachers are evaluated as being unsatisfactory, proficient, accomplished, or distinguished. And then um, what I like about this rubric is that it gives some specific um, examples of how you can um, model this particular criteria. So to be distinguished in the area of knowledge and respect for the Catholic doctrine and beliefs, you display extensive knowledge of your faith and uphold and defend the teachings to others. And then within varying um, levels of uh, proficiency at that. So uh, part of an unsatisfactory rating then as a part of this evaluation process um, triggers kind of a, an additional steps uh, for teachers for whom that might be difficult or might be something that they're struggling with. So then we that starts a whole new um, layer of meetings and goals and observations and those kinds of things. The next criteria, um, the shares the charism of Catherine McCauley and the Sisters of Mercy again, demonstrates a thorough understanding and support for that charism and incorporates that charism into their curriculum fluently. Um, some of this pertains in particular to, we, I see this a lot um, in using the critical concerns of the Sisters of Mercy. So we have, you know, environmental issues that we talk about. We talk about that from the, I, from the idea of the critical concerns, as well as things like racism and as such. So our senior theology classes, um, Talk, talk a great deal about Catholic social teaching. And so this, that's where that comes into play. Uh, our freshmen in theology and then in other classes talk about the theology. They have a, a short unit on each of the critical concerns of the Sisters of Mercy so that they understand um, when we talk critical concerns, they have an understanding of what that is. The third criteria is that they make Catholic and mercy symbols, liturgies, and teachings a part of the classroom life. So inside each classroom, you've got this mission statement hanging up. Many classrooms have a, um, a mercy cross in addition to a crucifix in the room. Um, we ask all of our teachers to begin class with a prayer. So uh, sometimes that's student-led. Some teachers have the students say the sushipe of Catherine McCauley. Um, sometimes it's teacher-led. It's that's it's very much a time for that class to kind of develop what's going to work best in their classroom. So um, you know, I have loved this for over twenty years as a teacher, just because it's where when you ask for intentions, that's where you find out a lot of stuff that's going on and things that they're worried about and things that are hurting them. Mm -hmm. So this is a um, it's a, a powerful tool to connect um, within that, you know, one of our eight periods of the day, this group is praying for this particular item. It's also, we also, our teachers also demonstrate this greatly um, by their participation at mass. We have teachers who are EMHCs. Uh, so they uh, help our senior uh, pastoral ministers uh, distribute communion. They, we have some of our, um, one of our teachers who's not even Catholic is um, one of the, our great band members at mass. So he plays the guitar for us for every mass. Um, we have guitar and a teacher that plays the drums for us and then a teacher that plays piano. So it makes our liturgies um, more lively and I think appealing to the students when they do that. And it's also that they can see that respect that uh, these teachers have, even if you're not Catholic, that you can still absolutely participate um, with us in our liturgies. Um, assisting our students in their Catholic spiritual developments, we try to uh, understand our Catholic faith and integrate it effectively into our learning goals. I was a math teacher, so that's not always possible on a day-to-day -day basis, but um, we try to, to work that uh, into our class when it's uh, appropriate. Uh, creates a classroom climate centered around Christian and mercy values that challenges students to integrate these values into their lives, actively participates in school prayer, and shares in a faith journey and commitment with students and a mercy community and the mercy community. And finally, forming that faith community actually actively promotes a collegial atmosphere 
Others are treated with a great deal of respect and dignity and are active models, uh, actively models the desire to undertake service by assuming leadership and responsibility. So I'll talk a little bit more about how our, our faculty helps, uh, helps promote service with us in, in, a, in a slide a little bit down the way. So we can't just expect them to walk in off the street and uh, promote us or just jump into this with both feet. So we try to find many ways for our teachers to, to really kind of um, immerse them into this community and our mission as well. So it begins with our new teacher orientation. Um, as someone else mentioned, we have our, in fact, our new teachers watch the video in God Alone from the Mercy World website. Um, and so that helps. And then Sister Dolores and I, between the two of us, um, spend a great chunk of that first morning of their first day um, trying uh, work, teaching them or helping them understand why, who we are and what we're about. Um, sorry, that's my phone going off just a second. I'm sorry. I, anyway. Um, each of our new teachers is assigned a mentor, and uh, those mentors have a specific list of um, topics that we want them to discuss with those new teachers. It's generally a faculty member who's been here uh, for quite a, a length of time, so they understand things. I try to find people that I think would kind of match up with the new teacher's personality. Uh, I try not to have it be someone within their school departments because I want the, their department chair can be that, that mentor for them um, in terms of academics, but this is not just academics. This is you know, helping them understand what it means to be a teacher here at Mercy. Uh, in addition to that, so they meet with those, fac those me meet, uh, faculty mentors about, it's, it's quite heavy at the beginning of the school year because at the beginning of the year we have Mercy Day and lots of new traditions for them to understand. And then as the semester um, kind of goes on, it's more like once a month or so. It goes from probably, you know, once a week at the very beginning to a couple times a month. And then down towards the end here, we get down to about once a month. In addition to that, I try to gather um, all of our new teachers together, usually like on a Friday afternoon and we hang out and just kind of talk about what happened, what's been going on and what's going to be coming in the, you know, coming up soon. Um, we have our own little language here at Mercy. So that's um, one piece where we can start to, so that they're not going, what is PA or, you know, some of these things. Um, and what is Mercy Day and why, are, why is, you know, why is this a secret about this? So in addition to that, um, we, I try to at faculty meetings, uh, if we're not talking about anything that's specifically related to um, the charisms of the, of the Sisters of Mercy in particular, um, I always try to start the faculty meetings with a prayer that I hope um, comes from, uh, that has some mercy, merciness to it. And Kim, it was interesting that you referenced that because that's what I have sitting right here is come to the table, which is a collection of, um, it was passed on to me from our former principals. It's a collection of prayers that were written by um, people connected to mercy. So there's a lot of familiar names in the back of this and they cover everything for a blessing, God be with you, give us courage for the journey, a prayer before a faculty meeting, just all kinds of different um, prayers that are, um, that I find very helpful. And as, as we begin um, every meeting with a prayer. Um, we also, every year, the faculty uh, goes on a retreat in either January or February. Uh, a couple of years ago, the faculty made a request that um, it had always been just a, a straight kind of retreat with prayer and, and reflection. And because of our um, push for our students to do service and the importance of service is in our lives, uh, we, they asked if we could, you know, maybe alternate. And so every other year now, we as a faculty go do service as a part of our retreat one year and reflect on that. And then the other years we have what's more of a traditional retreat as you've experienced in the past. Um, we've had our faculty members volunteer to help plan that uh, faculty retreat. And I think that's, they, they like that a lot because it then focuses on something that we are want to pray together about, as opposed to bringing someone in who doesn't necessarily know us very well to come in and just kind of tell us what they think we need to think about and pray about. So, um, and then 
An another example of, of how we try to develop this mission is through, we have faculty prayer services. Um, these are more interspersed um, throughout the year. We have one at the very beginning of the year, one generally before Christmas, and then one at the end of the year as we recognize people who are leaving us and people um, and just celebrating that what that year was and the gifts that we received that year. So as we try to develop them into praying um, and growing together in faith and in um, our mission specifically here at Mercy. I said I would tell you a little bit about how our faculty has opportunities to demonstrate their mission and um, Again, the first time, the prayer in the classroom, absolutely, every day. Um, I think it's good for the girls to see to see their teachers offering intentions for prayer or, and standing and praying or sitting and praying together. Our retreats for our students, um, they are one-day retreats for our freshmen, sophomores, and juniors. They happen, our freshmen and sophomores uh, happen in the spring and our juniors and seniors happen in the fall. And uh, we have students, juniors and seniors helping with the freshman and sophomore retreat, but we also need faculty adults there to be there as well. And teachers have the opportunity, they volunteer to be a part of this. We really want the teachers there who want to, to help facilitate those retreats and not be, we've not be forced to, to be sitting on retreat because they're not promoting a good atmosphere for the girls at that point. So um, our senior retreat in the fall is actually an overnight retreat and we have teachers, you know, knocking down the door to help participate in that one. So to help chaperone that one, it's a, it's a powerful retreat. It's a great time to spend um, praying with these girls that we've been with for three years. And as they begin their senior year um, to help them uh, start that process of um, recognizing that, that they are becoming women of mercy and that's what we want for them. And what does this call to mercy? What have we been preparing you for for three years um, to go out in the world to make a difference there? Uh, in addition to retreats, all of our full-time faculty are homeroom sponsors and most many of them are not particularly um, faith-based activities. They're, they're pretty procedural in a lot of cases, but our seniors in the fall uh, do a play to celebrate Mercy Day. So they choose um, one or two or a few members of their class who they think best represents Catherine McCauley. And then they tell the story or tell a, take a twist on the story of what like, this year, for example, they um, were, they asked our, some of our alum, alumni who they feel are doing mercy work in the world today to write letters. And so um, those girls either came to school and were part of this performance or they wrote letters and our girls represented them. But this is how they see our current, our alumni being women of mercy in the world. And so that was very powerful. Other years, it's kind of a straight retelling of the story of the founding of the House, um, House of Mercy on Baggett Street and that, but this one in particular, um, and many years they take a little bit different spin on that. As homeroom sponsors, those senior sponsors really help guide the girls in um, constructing that play and, uh, and you know chaperone their play practices and such. But that Mercy Day is such a, a beginning of the, um, like we're turning this over, you, know, you guys are the leaders of the school now. So you ladies are going to be the ones um, telling the story in the future, so. Uh, we have lots of uh, extra opportunities for the teachers to help give of time. We have um, like candlelight masses and things here at Mercy that they help us chaperone. Um, and much of that is done. They lead all kinds of um, prayer groups and other things after school uh, that are not paid positions. So in addition to you know their, their paid duties of teaching all day, they provide a lot of help. Um, we had CLC groups here for a while where um, they were working with students, you know, off, you know, in the evenings as prayer communities there. And then finally, um, a huge example is that they chaperone our service trips for us. We do um, a trip to the Dominican Republic for service every other year. And so we have teachers that uh, go with the students for a week in this, at the beginning of the summer to, for that. And then we have ha offered a 
trip to Misericordia in Chicago over our spring break where our girls go and do service uh, there for the week of spring break. And we have teachers who chaperone that as well. And they're not all teachers. It's our recruitment director has gone with the girls um, and such. So those are just the beginnings of opportunities. Our junior retreat is a one day retreat, but the girls go out and do service in the Omaha community for the beginning of that retreat. And we have teachers that go out and do that with them. So they spend, they could either spend the day in their classroom working or they can go out and do service with the girls. And there's a number of them that choose every year to go and um, help the girls with service there. So um, that kind of sums up my, how we um, evaluate for mission and the opportunities and how we try to immerse our faculty in our mission. Uh, I'll shift gears a little bit now, and unless anybody has a question right now about, about what I've talked about so far. I have a question. Yes. Uh, only in so far as I've been an educator all my life and I feel like we're pretty good at distinguishing and being honest with students, but it's very hard for us to be honest about ourselves sometimes. Um, in your rubric, it looked like not a huge difference between unsatisfactory and proficient. I, I saw the word minimal there a lot. Mm -hmm. And I understand the difference. Rubber hits the road. Can, can a faculty member remain at the proficient level here indefinitely as long as they're maybe like superb in their discipline? Or how do you parse that out? I think that that's where it gets kind of hard, I think. And to be honest, I haven't, I've only been doing this, you know, three years. So I'm not, I haven't hit anybody that I really feel is, is not, um, is not trying to be a part of the, our faith community here. And so that's where I would, that's where I guess I will, you know, it's a conversation absolutely of, you know, I would love to see you participate in this more to be, you know, um, but I haven't got a whole long, I don't have a long track record with you to tell you, you know, why well, I would give you four years and then you're done, you know, and that's not, that's not it. But my goal would be if you, I want you to love this building, love this mission, love these girls, love this community so much that you want to be a part of things. And so how can I help you find what is the one thing that you might want to help us participate in an arm? You know, what's one piece of our mission that you think that you would really help us with? So someone who may not be real comfortable like sharing their faith necessarily with students helps us a lot with helping them develop artwork for our, um, for even like May crowning programs and those kinds of things and really works with our girls on incorporating the mercy values into legacy projects that they leave around the school. So I think things that are not always, I think I try to find where are you, what part of our faith community can you help us with that doesn't require you to stand up and, you know, lecture at mass or something like that. Thanks, that helps a lot. Okay, I'll continue on then. So I can't, I told Kim, I don't know that I'm an expert in this, but I will tell you what I've, what I've learned in particular over the last uh, few years. Um, we've, there was just an article published in the Omaha World Herald yesterday about how many uh, uh, teachers ha have left the teaching profession, particularly last year, um, last spring. Uh, we've been blessed. I had I had three teachers who left, and and you know one of them was moving, so that was you know not an issue on our part. And so uh, the other two were just pursuing other opportunities, and that's great. We hated to lose them, but recognized that you know that they were ready to move on and try something new. So that's that's good. Um, trying to hire to replace them, uh, for the most part, I had two people walk in who. Um, one taught at another Catholic high school in Omaha, and she uh, knew of our mission. And that was a huge drawing piece because our school is different from the one where she was. And she, she was just so attracted to our mission and what she had seen and heard in the community about our school. So that's why she wanted to apply to Mercy High School. So that was 
that was awesome. And she's fabulous. She's a fabulous teacher. And we're so happy to have her. And she has bought in hook, line and sinker to everything that we are um, asking of her and as a community, you know, as, that we value. Another teacher actually had, again, was teaching at another Catholic high school here in Omaha, but had done work. She had um, spent a, some, like a summer in Ireland and she connected with the Sisters of Mercy in Ireland at a small parish and just kind of fell in love with the Sisters of Mercy. So when this job opened up here for an English teacher, which doesn't happen very often, she jumped at it immediately and you know could, could tell me very much you know, what was important to her about the Sisters of Mercy. So I think God kind of puts these people in your place at the right time. So that's awesome. Um, and so those two, the math teacher I had a little bit harder time finding um, a replacement for. So I'm teaching a section of AP computer science this year because I don't have anybody else to do it. So uh, I can't say that I'm the expert on finding math teachers right now, but I did find an alum actually who is teaching GED classes, who's come in and is kind of long-term subbing for me for a couple math classes that's helping a lot so that I don't have to worry about those. Um, so that leads me into um, stay in contact with your alumni. Uh, for us, 24% of our entire staff are uh, Mercy alums, um, including our recruitment directors and um, our receptionists and people like that, as well as 26% of our teachers. So. Um, that part makes finding the mission of Mercy very, um, they, they get us, they know what we're doing, they are excited about things that made their high school um, career or their high school experience so much more full and vibrant. And so um, I try to find out which of my girls are majoring in secondary education and offer them opportunities. I have one coming in later this week who wants to student teach with us next fall. So I'm very excited to welcome her back and uh, give her that, you know, talk to her about those opportunities that would be available. In addition, uh, I try to stay in contact with our local colleges and universities, um, one of whom is College of St. Mary, which is a Mercy School here. Uh, Creighton University, I have a good uh, rapport with, you know, some several of their faculty and uh, staff there that help us kind of to place, you know, young people who want to student teach to come um, spend that time with us. Our theology teacher that I hired a year ago, um, actually, we knew of her because she had come to do observations when she was a Creighton student here. And so she had spent time in our theology classrooms, and this was her dream, was to be a theology and music teacher. And I had those two openings at the same time. And we knew her, and we liked her, um, and she understands us. She knows what we are, what we're doing, and she understands our girls, and she understands what's important to us here at Mercy. Um, as I said, there's uh, seven other Catholic high schools in Omaha, and we are, you know, competitive, yes, but I think also it's, we get together, the principals uh, get together once a month or so and have lunch together and, and talk and, you know, have a great, relate. I feel a very good relationship with the other principals of the high schools here. The presidents of the schools get together, our uh, recruitment directors have a group that gets to, that meets as well. So, for as much as we are um, trying to recruit students, we also understand that it's also for the best of Omaha if we can help each other um, when we do. So, at, you know, as people are looking to hire someone, um, you know, we just ask each other, hey, if there was someone that, you know, sent you a resume for a math position that you are not going to hire, would you please forward that to me um, so that I can have that opportunity? And that's how I've, you know, we've, we've shared resumes with other um, schools and they've shared with us. So that's been very helpful. Like I said, I don't, I don't know how, I think we're very blessed and lucky that we have that kind of relationship here. And it wasn't anything that I started by any means. I stepped into a, relation, a collaboration that was already very well developed. Uh, as I was, I don't know if I said this or not, but I was at a meeting at RH, uh, the Diocese of Omaha last week and um, our superintendent of schools here has been working very hard to help recruit uh, new teachers to the Omaha area. So she's been going to some of the colleges, not necessarily in the Omaha metro area, but some of them further out um, in the state to help, um, again, encourage them to come to the Catholic schools, consider the Catholic schools in Omaha as a place for you to do your student teaching and as a place that you might want to work someday. So 
I think she's been doing a lot of work with that. She's also participating in some um, committee work on the statewide level to help help us to maybe change some of the requirements for cer certification in the state of Nebraska, be more accepting of uh, certification from other states. So that's just to make it easier because it's getting harder on all of us, especially the last couple of years to attract uh, new people to work in our schools. That being said, a big point that they made at the meeting last week and that I fully agree with, it's much more cost effective to retain our current faculty and staff than to, um, to try to recruit new people. And not that fresh, you know, fresh ideas aren't uh, very, they're, they're very welcome and, and needed, but um, it's if we can keep our current faculty and staff happy, which we try very hard to do. The easiest way to do that is through our culture. Um, and I hope that I think I'm, I've always been very proud and loved that our faculty were, they're, they're friends with each other. It's not terribly cliquish. They, um, we ask that they're out in the hallways in between classes as a um, kind of a supervision type thing. But what they end up doing is they end up standing around certain classrooms and talking to their, to their colleagues. And that I'll, I'll give up the supervision piece. So if they're talking to each other and laughing and joking and having a good time, that's a, that's a great thing. Um, one thing that we talked about with my fellow principals at this meeting is that um, we may not have, you know, a lot of bonuses or those kinds of things that we can give to our faculty, but this year in particular, um, even though we're all in school and things are feeling more normal, um, the dealing with the, the setbacks, like especially among our freshman class, um, who weren't some of them, if they came from our Omaha, from the public schools in the area, like they were fully um, remote the first semester of last year and then only hybrid the second semester of last year. So there's a lot of gaps that need to be filled in and it's falling on our teachers now to try to do that. So rather than offering them necessarily professional development on something else, can we give them some time just to help get caught up and maybe take something off their plates um, just to make their lives a little bit easier because it has been, again, especially for the freshman teachers, it's been kind of a rough, a rough year just trying to get everybody. Um, as I said, we draw from 60 different schools around the, around the community. So trying to get everybody back on the same page or closer to the same page in the same chapter maybe even um, has been more difficult this year than it normally is. So um, that being said, I am not, I know it's different in different areas of the country and different things might work for you in recruiting and maintain or retaining your faculty. So I would even offer this up to those of the mentors in the group who've had experiences um, here uh, the last few years, uh, especially with how uh, better ways to uh, recruit new faculty members. If any of you have more to add, I am, I am very humbly offering you this opportunity to, to jump in as well. Does anyone have any questions? Um, my name is Suli. I'm from Our Lady of Mercy in Syosset, which is Long Island, New York. Um, mm -hmm. I like the fact that you share the mission statement every meeting. I think it keeps it centered and focused. One thing that we, we do um, when we start each meeting, we try to start with something positive, like if they have any positive news to share, any little bit, you know, because mm -hmm. it just creates a certain atmosphere, you know, um, whether it's, you know, someone's having a baby, whatever it is, you know, you share the news and it just brings a better atmosphere and it's, it just changes the tone. But I do like the fact that you have the mission statement there. I think that's something good to have as well because it keeps it center and focused. Thank you. We started something with the girls a few years ago, we call it the Spirit of Mercy Awards. Um, and so um, teachers, when they see someone doing something extraordinary or, um, you know, just be, or volunteering to serve in some capacity, uh, they 
they send those to our um, Holly McCoy, our dean, our assistant principal, and she pushes publishes those at the end of the bulletin every every week so with the schedule for the next week and such and what kind of what we're doing um so then we started that same kind of thing with our faculty and it's a um we call them again spirit of mercy awards but they're specifically recommended their awards that are given just from other faculty members and as we begin our prayer um we always um are thankful for the, those so it's not it's you know it's not the somebody's having a baby but it's at least like that recognition that that these people have been um, have done something extraordinary from their peers who are thankful for that. So that's a great. I I didn't think of that earlier, but that's a great um, a great um, example as well. Christy, just out of curiosity, what's the population of of Omaha? Um, we're a little over a million people. Okay. I do. I, I mean, it seems like it's um, there's there's more Catholic uh, presence in Omaha than there are in a lot of similar sized um, cities. Yes, it's a it's very, very Catholic true? there. Um, so that makes it um, and actually when I was in high school, there were even more Catholic schools who have since more parish Catholic schools that high schools that have since uh, closed. So we're, we've kind of we've ridden steady here at these eight for the last probably uh, 1995 was when the last new one opened. So that's uh, these eight. It's been these eight since 1995. So, but it's a it's a great, very Catholic community. Yes. Christy, I might have missed this when you were talking because I was writing down notes. Um, but one way, certainly, to uh, attract and retain faculty is is good equitable pay, you know, and, and benefits. And that's something we've had to work on at Assumption in terms, because we have so many schools and a very strong public system in terms of pay and benefits. And sometimes people who love our mission and want to be able to teach there have four kids and just simply can't afford to teach in the school. It was worse five years ago. I think it's much more doable now, but, and it's also hard to sell that social justice value if we're not anywhere near uh, the other pool of schools in. And I know money's tight, but but I think making that a priority along with other priorities has helped us re attract what we want mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and keep them a little bit better. So I agree. Um, that's been a, um, we've been very lucky. Uh, Sister Dolores has worked, they've worked hard to keep our faculty pay and benefits. We're not close to the public schools yet, but we're very close with our peers, um, very much in range with our the other Catholic schools. But I will say it's, a, it's one of our, we just began a strategic plan here. And that's one of the areas is um, benefits and sal salary and benefits. And how can we, um, I know they're researching that and working on those to keep those, I think benefits is probably one of the areas, honestly, where we've kind of fallen behind in some areas. Any other uh, comments or questions for Christy or Sister Pat? Uh, one thing I would like to um, offer, uh, we, we do record all of these uh, presentations, the New Leader Orientation Program presentations, and they are on our um, Mercy Education website. And last year, uh, we had a presentation on human resources and uh, Mary Klingenberger, who is the president of Mother Macaulay in Chicago, uh, offered uh, a lot of the, um, what I would call extra benefits. So, you know, certainly part of the healthcare benefits, but some of the other um, things that, you know, she's been able to offer her faculty um, to, to help supplement maybe, you know, the, the pay disparity, um, although, you know, they've worked on that, but, um, you know, she's providing a lot of really great suggestions on things. So just one, one um, example is she will bring in uh, some financial experts that will uh, work with their younger faculty to make, you know, to, to go through and make sure that they're 
you know, investing uh, for their retirement. And um, they, they have a lot of, they have a great relationship with um, the local Mercy Hospital and another hospital where um, they bring in uh, wellness um, visits. You know, uh, they'll provide flu shots, they'll provide yoga classes and massage and, you know, just different things like that. And um, I know in my experience, I have found, and Christy mentioned, you know, like that gift of time. I, I do believe that our faculties, you know, are so, you know, mission driven and it's more of a vocation and it's the little things that you can do that really go such a long way. Um, so when you can show your appreciation and you can provide some of these um, smaller options in, in lieu of being able to quite get to that percentage um, of your competing schools, I think it really does make a, make a huge difference um, within, the, within the community. So any, any other um, questions or comments before we, before we end? I just wanted to uh, thank Sister Patricia and uh and christy for tremendous uh, uh information and uh was very very enjoyable thank you jared and and please allow me to offer my thanks on behalf of mercy education um, sister pat thank you for emphasizing the importance of the relationship between the head of school and the chair of the board um, and having it be one based on you know good communication and support of one another and building mutual trust um, for uh, something that I wrote down right away, um, the, the board's role in making sure that the mission is alive and well. Um, I think we can all remember that. Um, and, and for asking the question, and both you and Christy had, had mentioned this about reflecting on how have the decisions that the board and the administration have made impacted and, and moved the mission forward in our school, just really important. Um, uh, talking about the importance of best practices for evaluation and some of the tools that Mercy Education can offer and the importance of evaluating on the Catholic identity. And uh, Christy, for um, your presentation on how you have incorporated that domain on Catholic and Mercy identity in, in your evaluation process and for really delineating all of the ways that you're, you are um, forming your faculty and staff to live out mercy, to build uh, the faith community um, and uh, how that the opportunities that are offered in your school for them to, to really be part of the faith community. Um, and also thank you for your great suggestions on recruiting and hiring for mission and, and, and for focusing on the importance of building a positive climate and culture within your school. So uh, to both of you, thank you again. And to all of our new leaders, thank you for taking the time to be on this presentation. We will be following up with sharing uh, some additional resources and um, if there are other things that we, we at Mercy Education can help, help you with, please do not um, hesitate to reach out to us. So uh, we wish you a, a blessed uh, day and week and uh, many blessings for the, hol for the uh, holiday season coming up, especially uh, Thanksgiving. So um, take good care, everyone. And thank you thank for you. being with us. Thank you, Kim, for all you do. Thank you. Thank you. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving.